In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for another blessed Friday evening. It is 6 p.m. all the way from Sydney, Australia. For those who are with us in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, we pray that you're always in good health and in good spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angel spirits, his ministers as a flame of fire. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled, at the voice of your thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds make their nests, the, the, sto the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness and it is night, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great, there the ships sail about. There is that uh, Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
Well, a very good evening to everyone. How are we? That's the way we thank the Lord Jesus always and forever for being so merciful, so compassionate and everlasting divine love that engulfs everyone and brings everyone to the truth for those who choose the light over darkness. We thank our Lord for these Bible preaching sessions uh, these precious moments where it is made possible by his grace and and by his blood which he shed on Calvary on the cross. Amen. Before we start, I'll ask our daughter in Christ, our beloved Jacqueline, to begin this evening with this hymn. Jacqueline. Um, we are continuing our topic in relation to the book of Revelation. And uh, this evening we are starting a new chapter, and that is chapter 17. And by the grace of our Lord, hopefully we'll be able to finish verse 1. So it is chapter 17 and verse 1. Here we go. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven balls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I didn't hear that. Amen. Can't hear you. Amen. I don't know. You need, to, you need to make some more noise. Come on. Amen. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Very good. So, chapter 17, verse 1. A small introduction. Today we are coming into a, a new circle. Chapter 17 and 18 talks about the great harlot. It is a new circle we are entering. Last week we spoke, and previous weeks, we spoke about chapter 16. And we said that chapter 16 is to do with the great tribulation directed to the Jewish people, our beloved Jews, of the end times, the 21st century. And at the same time, it will cover the entire globe. And we have been seeing and tasting some of those things that are related to the Great Tribulation, which will lead up to a, an absolute catastrophic ending, more than likely in the 21st century. Now, chapter 17 comes into a new sort of circle and uh, we will be talking about this great harlot in fact 17 and 18 chapters 17 and 18 talk about the great harlot chapter 19 will be talking about the bride of christ which is the church the bride of christ which is the church a small introduction um, about chapter 17 and 18 Chapter 17, we'll be talking, who is this woman, this great harlot? Who is this woman? What is this woman? And where is this woman? Who is this woman? What is this woman? And where is this woman? Chapter 18, we'll be talking about the judgment upon this woman. The judgment upon this woman. And chapter 19, as we said, it talks about the bride of Christ. We'll look at a small comparison between this harlot, this woman who is a harlot and the bride of Christ. Chapter 17, we can divide into two um, sections. Verses 1 to 6, it talks about how John the Beloved sees this harlot woman. Verses 1 to 6, how John the Beloved sees this harlot woman. And verses 7 to 18, which is the end of chapter 17, verses 7 to 18, it is the angel, one of the seven angels, how he is revealing this harlot woman to John the Beloved. So verses 1 to 6, how John the Beloved sees this harlot. And then verses 7 to 18, end of chapter 17, one of the seven angels, how he is revealing this harlot woman to John the Beloved. There's going to be a lot of information today. My sincerest apologies in advance. 
and I love it when I put you on the spot. Thank God it is recorded and it's live streamed, so you can always go back to it and listen to it maybe a hundred times till you get what we're talking about here, hopefully in a couple of times. Now, we'll come to verse 1. We see one of the seven angels who had the seven balls came and talked with John the Beloved. And he was saying to him, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The great, the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. We, we see this angel, one of the seven angels who came to speak to John the beloved to show him the great harlot. We will see it is the same angel. He will show him the bride of Christ in chapter 19, the very angel who is going to show John the beloved, the harlot woman. It is the same angel who will be showing John the beloved, the bride of Christ as well. Now the question is why? The reason, the answer to that is the following. Because when humanity in general, when we face tribulations, when we face bad news, when we face obstacles, we hear nothing but negative, negative, negative. What happens to us? Naturally, we become disheartened. We begin to losing hope and eventually faith will fade away. So God, in the midst of our troublesome times, He will always come back and give us hope and uplift us. And this is why this angel, even though he is showing John the Beloved all the negative aspects of what is going to happen in the 21st century, in the midst of all those dark times, the Lord is saying, but the bride of mine will always be upstanding ever so strong than ever before the bride of christ is the church the lord is saying no matter how many tribulations no matter how many trials no matter how many tidal waves come against my church let me tell you my beloved christians and let me say to the entire world the church i built it with my own precious blood on Calvary, on the cross. It is I, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the rock of all ages, upon which I have built my own church with my own precious blood. Let me tell you, no one can ever touch my church unless I say so. And no one can ever bring down the very church whom I have purchased with my own precious blood, period. No matter how, the world tries heavily attacking the church so fiercely, which we've been seeing, but unfortunately we'll be seeing much greater attacks happening in the very near future. Now, but the church will be standing and the church will be blameless at the end for the Lord. He will come again to take his bride without a blemish, without a stain, perfect as he is and take her to the father's house, the final frontier the Father's house, the heaven of all heavens, where we will live with Him for eternities to come, where it will never end, where it will never end. When this angel came to show John the Beloved, this harlot woman, he took John to the desert. When he came to show him the bride of Christ in chapter 19, he took John up to a high mountain. So when he showed him the harlot, he took him to a desert. But when he came to show him the bride of Christ, he took him to a very high mountain. Now, what is the desert here? Represents the world. Represents the world. And the mountain, the desert, you go down. The mountain, you go up. The world will take you down, my beloveds, but the mountain will elevate you and exalt you, will take you up. We read in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, Luke 10, 30. 
The Lord Jesus gave this parable. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. My goodness, the moment you leave Jerusalem, which is the presence of the Lord Jesus, there is only one way for you, one trajectory. That is down here, downward. You're going down, brother. And they say it linguistically. They say, let's go downtown. Have you heard this phrase, downtown? You see, the language is a negative one. Going down means it's a failure. You are falling to your absolute destruction, your end. You want to go downtown, you'll, you will face nothing but absolute destruction. Where are you going, my son? Where are you going, my daughter? Downtown is not the place for you. You belong uptown, up the mountain, not down the desert of this world where nothing but venomous, uh, satanic, evil agendas are awaiting humanity. Don't go to the world. Don't chase the world and its temptations. Let Satan have it and stick it on his forehead if he's got one. The mountain is the bride of Christ. Well, the desert represents going down. It's the, it's the world, it's failure. The mountain therefore represents success, glory, exaltation, honor, etc., etc. All the good things. When the angel showed John the Beloved the, this harlot woman, he showed him this woman being arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. My goodness, she was dressed up. She was dressed up to the occasion, wasn't she? But when this angel showed John the Beloved the Bride of Christ, she didn't have all these colorful outfits. She didn't have any gold and precious stones and pearls. She had only one dress, one color, and that was white. The dress white and white represents righteousness. It is the dress which the Lord Jesus himself rose from the dead with. He rose from the dead dressed up in white from head to toe. This is the dress of the heavenly. Of the heavenly it is righteousness there is no stain there is no sin there is no blemish there is perfection there is holiness there is glory and exaltation there is righteousness now why was this harlot woman dressed up in those colorful outfits well those colorful outfits my beloved the end of them is absolute destruction and those colorful outfits represents the world the world is full of colors one color star city casino the other color drugs the other color alcoholism the other color gambling the other color stealing lying killing men women women, men, in between, above and below, LGBTQ, RSTUYZ. This is the colors of the scarlet, of the harlot woman. The world, those colors represents the temptations of the world. So many deceptive ways of the world are these colors, my beloved. But the bride of Christ is only one. The Lord is straightforward. The Lord is the light of the world. With Him, everything is vividly clear. With Him, everything is straightforward. With Him, you are living in clarity and in, in absolute righteousness. Steadfast, there is no twisting, falsification of the truth. You are walking in the truth, living in the truth. In the book of Proverbs, which belongs to King Solomon, now the book of Proverbs teaches you on how to be wise on earth, teaches you wisdom on earth. Proverbs 14, 2, 14, 12, beg your pardon. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Wow. Look at King Solomon. There is a way. That seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. 
You see, when you go out first with so-called friends to experience life for the first time coming out of the cage called home, and you're going into the free world, and you're going with those friends, the first time the way seems to be very right. Man, I'm really enjoying this. I was, I was imprisoned all these years at home by mom and dad. For the first time, this bird is flying out of this cage. I am free and I'm really enjoying it. The way is right. I'm having fun. I'm enjoying it. I'm mixing. I'm associating. I'm exploring. I am expanding on my knowledge and on my insight. But the end of this way, King Solomon says, it is death. I left home so innocent. I ended up being so corrupt and polluted. I ended up, ho I left home so pure. I ended up being defiled by the harlot women, all the colors of the world. I started to speak in a foul language. I started to walk in a crooked and twisted ways. I was so pure. And now I am so miserably corrupt. Please find some seats for these, our beloved people there. By all means, God bless you. And we are very privileged to have you here. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Not everything that feels good is good for you. Not everything that is seen to you as being right is right. You need to let God be the definer of what is right and what is wrong. Don't ever take that definition into your own hands. Let God show you the way. Let God bring people that he chooses your way. Don't ever choose people outside of God. Let God choose them for you. Let God, and by the way, a family is God's choice. So what do we do? Us intelligent kids, we go against our families and we befriend strangers in the street. Aren't we smart? No wonder we get into so much trouble. No wonder we lose track of what is right and what is wrong. No wonder. But the world helps you to walk away from family values. Yes. Actually, the world is attacking family values and family bonds. And we'll get to that. This, this harlot woman. And I'm going to blow her up. Well, don't forget I have red belt in karate, so I'm kind of dangerous. We see the end of this woman, this harlot woman, she ends up in fire. And we see the end of the bride of Christ in glory. The woman disappears and dies, and the bride of Christ lives forever. My goodness. Now let's come to verse 1. That was all an introduction. That's why I said I hope we finish today. Verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The great harlot is Babylon. Because in the same chapter, we'll, we'll, be, take, we'll be reading that and, and commenting on that next week, God willing. Babylon, he says that the, the great harlot is Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And before anybody speaks, I'm not talking about Babylon in Iraq, Mesopotamia. I come from that country. It's got nothing to do with that Babylon. So relax, Assyrian people. This has got nothing to do with Babylon. So, um, but this great harlot, chapter 17, John the Beloved says that it is the great, it's Babylon the great, the mother of all harlots and, the, and of the abominations of the earth. 
We all know, or maybe not all of us, but most of us, I hope, we know Babylon of old is in Mesopotamia, Iraq. That is where our father Abraham came out of Babel, out of Iraq, and ended up in the promised land, where the Israelite nation came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But our father Abraham, Assyrian, from the from Ur of Babel, Babylon. Now, why is he calling this woman a harlot? In other words, adulteress. Adulteress. A harlot is, is talking about Christianity here, a Christian nation a christian nation a harlot is is somebody that is bounded to christ by name only but bounded to satan by deeds a harlot is someone who is bounded to christ by name only but bounded to satan by deeds i call myself a christian but all my deeds are of evil origin that is a harlot And, they, and there are only two kinds of Christians. One Christian is by name, and the other Christian is by name and deed. Some stop at the level of name only. I'm a Christian. I've been to church. I was baptized when I was an infant. I've received the body, the holy, the, the body and the blood of Christ. Um, and I read the Holy Bible, but I've never came to know Christ. I've never tried to have a personal relationship with Christ. I stopped at the level of being a Christian by name, but I never sacrificed for the sake of the Lord and for the sake of getting to know Him more and more at a personal level. If I am a Christian by name only, then my deeds will be taken over by Satan. Unless I give my entire being to the Lord Jesus, Satan will control me. And therefore I'm a fake Christian. I'm a fake Christian. The Lord knows me not at the end. Very dangerous, very dangerous. This great harlot was sitting on many waters. Many waters, he explains in verse 15. Same chapter 17, verse 15. Many waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In other words, this great harlot is sitting on the entire world. Sitting on the entire world. What is the world? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and all tongues. So she's sitting on the entire world. Now, if Babel here means Iraq, then the question that arises here, does Iraq control the whole world? The answer obviously no. Therefore, this Babylon, the great, the mother of all harlots, is not talking about Babylon of Iraq, Mesopotamia, Middle East. It is talking about another Babylon of our era, not the old one, but the new era. Because the Babylon of old definitely does not control the whole world. But this harlot woman is sitting on many waters, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. She is sitting, i.e. controlling the world. Therefore, this Babylon is a different Babylon. It's not the old, but it's the new one. Now, who is the Babylon of our times ruling the world, sitting on many waters? None but the United Nations. None but the United Nations. We spoke about this in, de in depth and details back in chapter 13 of Revelation. We spoke about this in depth. The United Nations is the Babylon of the 21st century. 
Let's look at the, word, at the word great. Why is he calling this harlot great? Why is she the great harlot? The word great. Greatness is connected with earth. Holiness is connected with heaven. Greatness is connected with earth. Holiness is connected with heaven. You see, anyone, any human being who is totally distant from God, that person will end up seeking their own greatness. They want to be great. Any human being that is distant from the true divine God, they will always seek to be great. And this is the world. Everyone in the world is running in this race to be the greatest of all, isn't it? America trying to be the greatest, China trying to be the greatest, Russia trying to be the greatest, the superpowers of the world, everyone is in conflict, everyone is, is actually running to see who is going to end up being the greatest. Why? Because this is the true sign when you don't have God in your heart, the true God. When you don't have the true God in your heart, you're seeking to be the greatest. Now, and what is being great? The word me, me, and nothing but me. It is either my way or the highway. Son, go to church. No, I'll do it my way, mom, not your way. Daughter, Come with me. No, I'm going with my friends. Why should I come with you, dad or mom? I'm going with my friends. I'll do things my way. You don't tell me otherwise. And I will not let anyone else telling me otherwise, including God. It is all about me because I live in this world. I live for this world. And for this world has to be me and nothing but me. Now, this is great absolutely great and don't we live in a great world amazing isn't it it's a very great in sickness it's a very great world in being morally bankrupt morally there's no more morals and I look I look at the presidents of the world it was only the other day, not in the, in the far distance. We had some presidents of great calibers. Nowadays, we see nothing but puppets. Acting so foolishly, acting so childishly, acting so ignorantly, absolute sickness, madness, little kids and adults, figures, running around in the streets. So sad. No more caliber. Very lightheaded. They, no, they have no idea where their right hand is from their left hand. No idea. And so sadly, we see that as well in the religious sector of certain church leaders. We see that as well. Very sadly to say. Greatness is to, is, is to connect with earth. Holiness connects with heaven. Heaven is not me. Earth is all about me. Heaven has got nothing to do with me. It is not me at all. Therefore, greatness means revealing one's self. Holiness, denying one's self. See, it's totally the opposite. Heaven and earth are totally opposite realms. Earth revealing oneself. Me, 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 me. Heaven denying oneself. And then we, fee, we see this in the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 9. He says, the Lord Jesus is speaking to the bride. He says, I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. I have compared you my love to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. 
Philly talking about horses. He says in simple terms, the Lord is saying to every baptized soul, the baptized soul in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He says, you are like a horse in the chariot of Pharaoh. Now who is Pharaoh? King. And who is the Lord Jesus? The King of all kings. So Pharaoh here symbolically represents the Lord Jesus. Now the king sits in a chariot and the, and the, and the thing that drives that chariot is the horse. So the horse is connected to the chariot in which the king sits. Wherever the chariot is, the king is. And wherever the chariot and the king are, the horse is also there too. Heaven is saying to Christians, the Lord is saying to all Christians, wherever I am, I want you to be there also. My child, you need to be connected to me like the horse connected to the chariot. You need to be attached to me like the horse is attached to the chariot. Are you attached to me or to the world? Christians, where are you? Where are you in relations to Christ? Are you in the church or in the club? Are you in the light or in the darkness? Are you taking the the heavenly wine, the true blood of Christ, or are you drinking the wine of evilness of this world of drunkenness? Are you dressed up or naked? Are you in holiness or in sin? Where are you, my beloveds? For wherever the chariot the king is, and wherever they are, that horse must be connected to it. I want you to be living a life of holiness. What is holiness? set apart totally different from the rest of the people of this world if christians imitate the world then when are you going to reveal christ to the world how are you going to reveal christ to the world if i as a christian i steal i kill i lie i take drugs i do all evil things under the sun then how can i testify how can i be a witness of christ to this world how can i bring the light of the world to this dark world my beloved i need to imitate the lord i need to imitate the lord jesus i need to imitate the lord jesus and in holiness saint paul puts it so eloquently in galatians chapter 2 verse 20 he says i have been crucified with christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Wow. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It is self-denial. What is self-denial? The Holy Cross. The Holy Cross is the only way to holiness. Unless we carry the cross and follow Christ, we are not worthy to be his disciples. We will never reach holiness unless we accept the cross in our life. And what is the cross? Death. And what is death? Biblically speaking, self-denial. And what is self-denial? Self holiness. What is holiness? Heaven. What is greatness? Earth. And what is greatness? Me, 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 me. What is heaven? Holiness. What does that mean? Not me. I am crucified with Christ so that I am no longer the one who is living, but it is Christ who lives in me. So as a Christian, it is never about you. It's about the Lord. So if you are the Pope, if you are the Cardinal, if you are the Bishop, if you are the priest, if you are the shepherd, it's nothing to do with you, my dear friend. So why are you so boastful about your position? Why are you so boastful about your rank and about your throne? It is about Jesus Christ of Nazareth who died and was buried and rose from the dead for you and I and for the entire world. It is about Christ the King, not us church leaders. Shame on us all if we do not glorify Christ in our lives. Shame on us. Shame on us, my beloved. And that goes for all Christians. 
It's about the Lord, not about us, my beloved. In the church, we fight over positions. Even in the church. Why is the church divided? Because of the throne. Everyone wants to be the greatest. But that is in the world. It shouldn't be in heaven. The church is in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, it's Christ, not me. Why am I fighting over thrones and positions and power in the church? We are the useless servants. What did the Lord Jesus say to the 12 apostles? Simon, Peter, Philip, Andrew, Bartholomew and the rest. He said, whatever you do, remember, you are nothing but useless, hopeless servants. It is I who is doing it through you. Without me, you are all nothing. Look at us now. We divided the church for the sake of thrones, authority and power. Why? Because we seek greatness in the church. My goodness. We allowed the world to infiltrate and enter the church. And we became worldly. That's why nowadays some churches are nothing but financial institutions. Their God is mammon. Honey, 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 make me money in this big wide world. So sad. So sad. The Lord Jesus, our Lord, the crown of our glory, died, shed his precious blood to, to purchase us all. And look what we're doing in return. My goodness. My goodness. The angel is calling her the great harlot because she wants to be a show off. And this is the life of the world. Calling her Babylon. One thing we need to understand about the book of Revelation. When the angel explains things to John the Beloved, that means those things are not written in the Old Testament. It's very important. When the angels reveal something to John the Beloved and then explains it to John the Beloved, that means it is not written in the Old Testament. However, when the angel talks or reveals something to John the Beloved, yet not explain anything about it, that means it is written in the Old Testament. We need to search for it. So when the angel revealed this harlot woman to John the Beloved being Babylon the Great, he did not talk about Babylon the Great. Why? Because it is already spoken of in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. That's why the angel did not explain anything about Babylon the Great. It is already explained in Genesis 10 and 11. And this is going to be the rest of the evening about the great harlot. That's why it's only one verse today. Now to understand who is this Babylon the great mother of all of harlots, we go to Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Chapter 10 and 11 of Genesis is talking about Babylon. Which Babylon? In Iraq. So, Revelation is saying to us, go back to Genesis and see what happened in the old Babylon to understand what is happening in the 21st century Babylon, the United Nations. It's the same Babylon. It's the same Babylon. Now, the very first city ever built in the world was built by Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, the brother of Abel. The very first city ever to be built on the face of this planet was built by Cain, who killed his brother Abel later on. When he built that city, he named that city after his son called Enoch. He named his son Enoch or Echnuch in our language, 
or in Arabic they call him Honak. Honak or Ikhnuch. In English, the pronunciation is Enoch. Now the word Ikhnuch, Honak or Enoch means wisdom. You learn a lot from these names. Called wisdom. It means wisdom. So he built the first city, Cain. And he named it after his first son, whom he called Wisdom, Achnuch, Honak, or Enoch. God, the Almighty, the true divine God, never intended for no man to build a city. Building a city is against God's wish and will. God never wanted human beings ever building a city. He never wanted that. Look at this. Again, I'll take you back to the Song of Solomon. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. I'll read it. It's not on the screen, but I'll read it out to you. King of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. This is the bride, the Christian baptized soul, seeking her good shepherd, the heavenly groom. Look at her. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city. And go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. Because my beloved soul, you cannot find your heavenly groom, Jesus Christ of Nazareth in the city. Where do we find the Lord Jesus? If we are truly seeking him from the heart, we will find him in a manger. Somewhere in Bethlehem. Wow. The king of all kings cannot be found in the city, but he was found in a little manger. Amazing. Amazing. The Lord in Matthew chapter 10 verse 5, when he sent his disciples, he said, he said to them, do not enter a city of the Samaritans. Lord, don't you want your gospel to reach out every corner of the world, every town, every street, every city? Yes, but he said, don't enter the city of the Samaritans. So why, Lord, you don't want your word to reach the city? He said, no. Why? Because my word will not find a place in the city. Because those hearts who live in the city have blocked me right out. Now why? Because in the city, there is me, not the Lord. In the city, there is my throne, there is my dignity, there is my pride and glory, there is my name and the stars, there is my power. It is all about me. When it is all about me, the Lord cannot find a place for him because I have blocked and shut every door in his face. It's all about me. This is the people of the city. Filth you find in the city. Destruction in the city. God, godlessness in the city. LGB in the city. And the prime minister walked with them in the street of the city. And he said, this is the new Australia from now on. And I said to Mr. Albanese, this is your Australia. Shame on you to say this is the new Australia. What are you going to say to the people of Anzac, those who fought for human dignity and rights? That is a very weak and shameful statement from someone in that position. Don't you dare say this is the new Australia. This is your fake Australia because there are true Aussies that will definitely disagree with you. But you see, when leaders become puppets, this is what you get. You get peanuts or monkeys or something. Oh. And the church is still agreeing. 
with the agendas. That's why a time is coming, the Lord will shut the doors of the church, and this time for good. In 2020, it was only temporary. That was a warning from the Lord to the church. That was a warning to the church, not to the world, to the church. No one can shut the door of the church unless the Lord accepts, unless the Lord permits. Whether you want to believe in that or not, that's your choice. But I can assure you, if you just have a small glimpse of the glory of Christ in the next life, you will understand he is definitely in charge, no one else. So do you think anyone will dare to touch his church? No one. So why was the door of the church closed in 2020 for about a couple of years, whatever it was, in between, you know? Because the Lord is not happy with the church. The church has become worldly, not spiritually. We started seeking positions, powers, and greatness. Where is the humility? What is missing in a big time in the church is true divine love and true humility. That's missing. We say we love one another, but it's only lip service. It doesn't come from the heart. You, we cannot deceive the Lord. You know, I can deceive the world, but I can't deceive the Lord. The Lord knows me more than me. He is the God of hearts, not lips. Why isn't the church uniting? Because there is no true love coming from the heart. There is no true humility being displayed before the king of all kings who is the humble of all humbles. He was born in a manger for God's sake. You're not going to find him in the city. You'll find him in a manger. My goodness. If you wish to self to deny yourself, you need to come out of the city. And please don't get me wrong when I say the city. I'm not talking about the, lit, the literal city, Sydney or Melbourne. No, I'm not talking about the city, city. I'm talking about your perception of life, your, how you perceive things, how you see things, how you handle things, what your heart says, what your conscience is saying. This is the city. Are you living for yourself or are you living for your Lord? If you're living for yourself, you are living in the city, even if you're living in a little village in the whoop whoop land. But if you are living for the Lord, even if you are living in a city, you are living in self-denial. It's about where your heart is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. Is your treasure just having fun in this world? Then it's all about you. Is your treasure Christ? Then he is in the heaven of all heavens. What are you doing seeking him in the city of this world? Lift up your head and look up to heaven. That's where your Christ is. If he is truly your treasure. Why are you chasing worldly things, materialistic things? Why are you fighting over materialism? Oh, my sister walked into my room and she used my Chanel. And my brother took my laptop without my permission. This is mine. You see, it's all about me. This is my room. This is my Chanel. This is my laptop. This is my dress. This is my house. This is my car. Listen, my dear friend, the reality of the whole matter, nothing is yours. The moment the spirit leaves the body, nothing. Neither this body, nor these clothes, nor any, any possession you thought you had, it is gone. Death will take it away from you, whether you like it or not. And we will all die, even if we say, I'm not going to die. Yes, I will. No one escapes this death. What are you going to take with you? Nothing. So what is yours? Nothing. Only one thing is yours forever. Christ the King. He is your portion, but you need to make him your portion. You need to choose willingly. 
freely to make Jesus Christ of Nazareth your portion for he is the only truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you Jesus Christ of Nazareth who is God revealed in the flesh this is the truth Christ is your only portion the love of my life some people like it when I say love you see why this soul couldn't find her heavenly groom in the city when she went out searching for him because in the city we build mansions high and strong walls I say look I've built this house myself look I've built this fortress myself I've built this mansion myself you see now I protect myself by myself I have provided my safety net with my own strength I am the protector of myself I am the peacemaker of myself when I live in that mansion when I have the Lamborghini when I have the millions in the account this is safety this is protection look what I've achieved look at me this is the world poor thing one little virus a flu oh, by the way forget about corona one little virus a flu all that mightiness and all that wealth you're 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 bed bound come on get up oh I'm sick what happened to you before you were the wealthiest and the strongest of all a little tiny virus dropped you dead amazing amazing how ignorant we are my beloveds the moment we lose track of Christ we lose track of who we of who we really are when I choose to live in the city lifestyle I'm saying to myself I'm seeking self-reliance but when I see Christ I'm saying to myself I'm seeking self-denial I'm no longer reliant on myself but I seek Christ to be my support sustainability and reliance therefore I will deny myself in order to live for Christ who provides everything I need and I lack. Psalm 127, 1. Look at King David. So beautifully he says it. Psalm 127, 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is the Lord who builds. It is the Lord who protects enough of me 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 it is the Lord who brought me here it is the Lord who spoke through me now it is the Lord who gave me this position this place everything is the Lord this is the truth everything is the Lord everything is the Lord what is in the people of the world two things civilization and wisdom I'm gonna try and sum it up Civilization and wisdom. What is civilization? Technology. Knowledge. Wisdom. Application. You see, when you get information, when you get knowledge, you need to implement that knowledge in your life. So the world or the people of the world are two things. Technology and wisdom. They have knowledge, worldly knowledge. And they have the wisdom which is worldly as well to apply what they have known at a worldly level people of the world search for knowledge you see them searching for knowledge always why is that you see to reach to reach one thing why do the people of the world seek knowledge and search for it to reach and understand what is good and what is evil that's what it's all about they are in search of knowledge to come to this realization of what is good and what is evil well what is good and what is evil is the conclusion and the summation of the of the uh, uh, city life that's what a city life is all about it is it is about good and evil 
is to know what is good and evil. And that takes us all the way to the very beginning of the human race, the Garden of Eden. What was in the Garden of Eden? There was a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where God warned Adam out of love, out of love and concern to his child. He said, Adam, whatever you do, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you do, surely you shall die. So the people of the world, they try frantically to gain knowledge in order to reach the understanding of what is good and evil. And that was the very tree from day one that destroyed the human race. Aren't the people of the world geniuses? Amazing. They want to reach this knowledge in order to destroy themselves. And aren't they doing that? Yes or no? Please tell me. Do you agree? What is happening in the world? They are seeking this knowledge to know what is good and evil, and they're applying it into this daily life to destroy life. They want to kill people. Everything now is contaminated. Chemtrail, thanks to the um, commercial um, jetliners, you see all those beautiful white uh, s strings <laughs> hanging in the air? That is chemtrail. That is not some sort of a conspiracy theory. That is a fact. It contains aluminum. One of the most deadliest and poisonous things when it gets to the human blood veins. Very poisonous. Why do you think cancer has increased so much? Why? Because of all these poisons in the air, in the ground, in the waters, in the veggies, in the food, everywhere. And now some worldly genius people who are seeking knowledge and wisdom, they want to come up with their own synthetic meat, a printing machine. You can print your meat while you're waiting. Why do you not? Because the cows, by the way, they are contributing to climate change. It is the biggest joke I have ever heard in my entire life. P poor cows. Listen. Cows have been on earth before mankind. Because when you read in the book of Genesis, days of creation, God created the cows. The last thing he created was the human race, Adam. So cows, they before us. Well, according to your scientific theory, which is Darwin, which is nonsense, but I'll go with you because it really shoots you in your, in your foot. Or, uh, you say the world is about 13 point something billion years. Well, let's say the cows have been around for, I don't know, tens of thousands of years, maybe millions of years. But if the cows have been contributing to climate change, we shouldn't be living by now. They release methane. You're releasing lies. You're more poisonous than any creature on the face of this planet. Stop releasing lies. My goodness. It's the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said to Adam, don't eat from it. The day you eat, you will destroy yourself. And what is the Garden of Eden? Doing it my way, not God's way. That the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is me. And there was another, tr another tree in the heart of the garden called the tree of life. And the tree of life is Christ, not me. I have crucified myself with Christ so that I not no live, I live no longer, but it is Christ who lives in me. I need to deny myself, but the world, they want to make sure they exist. My goodness. You see, the issue with humanity getting to know what is, what is good and evil, the issue with this is one thing. The moment human beings, fallen, corrupt nature of human beings, distant from God, from true divine God, 
that human being that is distant from God, the moment they get to know what is good and evil, their human nature will definitely lean towards evil, never towards good. It is a human nature. We all lean towards evil, not good. I'll give you an example, a very simple one. A human being will attend a concert from one of these Hollywood celebrities. They will pay big bucks to get the front rows and they don't mind sitting there for 24 hours nonstop. And even after 24 hours, they'll say, what a shame it finished so quickly. It felt like 24 seconds. But that human being tried to bring him to church and to sit in the church listening to this bishop that talks for too long. When I speak for an hour or two, everybody starts aching, getting tired, yawning, the eyes shutting, the back is going, the knees are shaking, the joints are falling apart. Everything is going wrong. In the church, I can't sit for too long. But in a party, in a concert, and I, wa -a -wa -a -duv -duv, I'll be sitting for hours on end and oh, what a feeling, Toyota. <laughs> Why in a party you're having fun? My daughter, when you go to a concert, you stand in front of that mirror for hours, but you don't have the time to read the Bible for 10 minutes. Wow. You have the time to stand in the kitchen and cook for hours. You don't have the time to kneel before the Lord and pray for 10 minutes. Amazing. If we put ourselves to the test, if we examine our soul, our, our situation, our status, I can assure you we will see ourselves so distant from the Lord, so lacking. So lacking, my beloved. I can talk on the phone for hours to me, mate. But I can't talk to the Lord for one minute. It's too hard. I'm too busy. I see one of my children, son, come to church. Father, believe me, I would have come. I would have run to the church, but I'm too busy. Yet I see this busy man going downtown how come you've got the time for downtown and you don't have the time for uptown you run for the darkness you don't want to run to embrace the light my goodness what's going on my child examine yourself sit for a moment hit on the brakes and say to yourself what am I doing, self? Where am I going, self? What am I trying to achieve, self? The world and everything in it is nothing but vanity of all vanities. What am I doing? I need to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I have sinned before you in heaven. I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore, but I beg you, Make me one of your servants that you have in your house. I'm coming back crying for mercy, Lord. I repent. I'm sorry, Lord. I have failed you. I have sold you like Judas Iscariot did. I have walked away from you. Yet you've always been faithful and loyal. You've never denied me. You've never walked away from me. You've never forsaken me. Yet I've done everything evil under the sun right before your very holy eyes. But today, Lord, I've come to this realization and I know it's your grace. I know it's the blood that you shed on Calvary. I've realized the more I've done it my way, the more of a failure I became. I went searching freedom my way. I became enslaved to Satan and the filth of this world, the temptations of the world, which is that scarlet, that harlot woman dressed up in purple and gold, precious stones and pearls, the colors of the world, 
the filth of the world. Today, I've had enough. I did it my way and I failed miserably. I'm coming, lifting up my hands, surrendering to you everything. And I'm saying, Lord, from now on, you do things in me your way. No longer I, but it is Christ who lives in me. Amen to that. Cain killed his brother because he seek the world. The city Cain built was destroyed in the great flood. After the great flood, very quickly, after the great flood, out of that ark came out Noah, our father, three of his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That city which Cain built, the flood, the great flood destroyed it. After the great flood, Noah went with his children, their wives, his wife, and they went to a place called Shinar. Shinar is Mesopotamia, between the two rivers of Tigris and Euphrates, Mesopotamia, Iraq, where Babylon is. Nineveh, the great city of Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire. So they went to Babylon. My goodness. History repeats itself. The descendants of Cain still exist. They haven't died. They are still in existence. So when they went to Babylon, Shem, Ham, Anya, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, out of Ham came his son called Cush. And Cush gave birth to Nimrod or Nimrod. Nimrod, my beloved, built four cities. If Cain built one, the descendants of Cain built four. The first one, Babel. <laughs> Babel, the first one. The second one, Erech in English, but it's Iraq in the proper pronunciation, which is Iraq. The name Iraq hasn't changed since the time of Genesis. Very ancient name. Very ancient name. He built Babel, Iraq, Akkad, and the last one, Kalne. Nimrod, you read that in Genesis 10, 8 to, 8 to 10. Genesis 10, 8 to 10. And the son of Ham, Cush, Genesis 10, verse 6. But Cush gave birth, uh, birth to his son, Nimrod, who built these four cities. You see that in Genesis 10, verses 8 to 10. My goodness. Do you know the name, what the name Nimrod means? The rebellious one. In Arabic, Al-Mutamarrid. The rebellious one. The name Nimrod. So who built the city? The one who went against God. And what was the first city? Babylon. What is Babylon in Revelation 17? The mother of harlots. Adulterous. The mother of harlots meaning, I'm a Christian by name, but I'm satanic by deeds. And who built that city? Nimrod, the rebellious one. What happened in the old Babel? They built a tower very quickly. Why did they build a tower? Because you see, those people that came out of the great flood, they said the reason why God flooded the whole world is because people lived in filth and sin to the core. And out of the wrath of God came the great flood to cleanse the whole earth from the sinful nature of that human being of that time. So when they came out of that great flood, they did not wish to give up on their sinful lifestyle. So they said, we will build a tower and this tower's head will be in heaven. Who is in heaven? God. Meaning 
they wanted to challenge God. They said Nimrod means I am not ignorant of God's existence. I believe God exists. I know God exists and I know what he's capable of. But having knowledge of all that, I will still do things my way, not God's way. This is Nimrod. You see, some people deny God out of ignorance, not knowing. But there are people deny God out of knowing deliberately. And how many Nimrods is there nowadays in the world? Plenty. One of them is Herrero Ferrero. He should eat Ferrero. It's a good Italian chocolate. I think it'll do him much better. There are so many people are Nimrod. They know God exists, but they challenge God. So what happened in Babel? Quickly, a tower was built. The head reaching heaven. Who is in heaven? God. You're God, we're God. Aren't people saying now we are God on earth? There is no God, it's us God. Well, Karl Marx said that. The founder of communism. He said, our father who art in heaven, stay there. You're God in heaven and I'm God on earth. Karl Marx, a member of the round table. Round table. British. Great Britain. Get me meaning. They build a tower. Now how, how come they build a tower? Because the nations assembled. The assembly of nations. Where do you see the assembly of nations? United Nations. What is that building in New York, Manhattan? The Tower of Babylon of the 21st century. You see, when people of the world gather together outside the circle of God, they will only get together for one thing, evilness. The people of the world, when they get together, they will only get together to do one thing, evil in the sight of God. The people in Babylon of old got together to challenge God and say, well, we're not going to give up on our sinful lifestyle. Therefore, if you're going to bring the flood again, we're going to build the tower. We'll go up in that tower, bring the flood. We'll escape it and we'll say, nah, 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 nah. and I'll still live the way I want, not you, God. The people, the nations of the world get together in the Tower of Babylon of the 21st century, New York, Manhattan, to do one thing, to speak about human rights, not God's rights. So human rights, United Nations are going to pass laws in the very near future and they are doing it. What are the laws? No more freedom of religion. Governments, you need to impose on churches. Christian world, you know why? They will attack Christianity more than any other religion with all love and respect. You know why? Because United Nations is built on Satan. And Satan cannot stand Jesus Christ only. He doesn't give one penny about any other religious figure with all love and respect. Because the only one who crushed the head of the serpent was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy name. So now, the UN, the Babylon, the mother of harlots, the adulterous one, of all adulterous, get together. All the nations are getting together in New York, Manhattan, to do what? To speak about human rights, nothing about God's rights. And if you speak about God, they will stone you to death. It's all about human rights. So human rights means if you're a man, you can be a woman. And if you're a woman, you can be a man. If you want to go out naked, you can. If you want to be neither a man nor a woman, go for it. You are free. It's all about human rights. Aren't we seeing this? Wake up. My son, my daughter, are you still chasing the world? 
Are you still going and having fun? Are you still going in those dark alleys? Are you still associating yourself with the wrong crowd? Stop it. Stop it. Satan is playing football with the world. Stop it, my child. Please, I beg you. No more Botox. No more laser. No more let God deal with you the way he knows the best for you. I beg you. I beg you. I beg you. If you wish to show yourself beautiful, show yourself for Christ, not for Satan. Because Satan will swallow you and will throw you nothing but a skeleton. Dead. Dead. So many young men and women destroyed their life. Irreversible damage. Irreversible damage. So many. Why? Because they wanted and they chose to do it their way. Not God's. Not God's. The United Nations get together now. The nations assemble. Assemble what? Against God. <laughs> Human rights. Wow. Well done. So now they want to get to your children. They want to, they have infiltrated, well, they've infiltrated everywhere. The so-called elites. The so-called elites, they've infiltrated everywhere. Even the church. Highest ranks in the church belong to them. Not all of them, but, but some are. <laughs> this is why the churches were closed for prayer, but they were open for jabs. In the name of safety measures, the governments know what they're doing. With all love and respect, doctors know what they're doing. But excuse me, the agenda is evil. There was never a pandemic. It was a pandemic from day one. There was never a virus. It was a man-made virus, nowhere near what they made it to be. Not fatal. They killed people deliberately. They poisoned people deliberately. Because the medical field is corrupt, it is governed by the big pharma, the biggest mafia. The political arena is corrupt. The religious arena is corrupt. The educational arena is corrupt. Everywhere is corrupt. And the technology, my beloved, look what they are doing, brainwashing millions upon millions of generations, destroying you, my beloved, with this iPhone, iPad, iPod, and iPad. Destroying you. What do you watch on that little screen? What do you see, my child? Filth. Poison. Poison. Hollywood. Poison. 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 The entertainment sector is also corrupt. And the mainstream media. <laughs> you will never hear good news or right news from the mainstream media. They will tell you what they want you to know. They will never tell you the truth. And this is why I always quote Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain during World War II. Winston Churchill said, the most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. And this is why it is quite often being surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. This is why it is quite often being surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. And the mainstream media, their role is one thing, to surround the truth with a bodyguard of lies. In order 
to achieve one thing, to make people believe the lie being the truth and the truth being the lie. And this is where the Lord God speaks in Isaiah, the prophet, and he says, you generation have called the light darkness and the darkness light, the sweet bitter and the bitter sweet, because you have lost track of the true divine God. Unless my beloveds, we come back to the Lord Jesus, human rights will only do one thing, enslaving us all and then eventually destroying us all. So now, we need to protect our children from the poison of Satan. I want to say this, so sadly I will say this. It's absolutely shameful of us as human beings to reach this low level where we cannot recognize our humanity anymore. My goodness, what has become of this human being? A time is coming, I can't say to a guy, <laughs> how is this man? Because I may be found to be offensive to that man because that man turned out to be not a man, where I saw everything being a man. Where is the fairness? The Western world, shame on you as the entire Western world to call yourself a democratic country. You are lying through your teeth. Democracy has got absolutely nothing to do with you. And by the way, democracy comes of the old ancient Greek people from the word democrata. Democracy was invented by the Greeks. It is something of old, nothing new. But that democracy that is founded and built outside the circle of God is nothing but the poison of the snake, Satan. And this is what we're witnessing in our time and age. So um, they're passing the law, and now they want to impose that law everywhere, teaching your children. If somebody wishes to, to choose a lifestyle, oh, they're free to do that. I am in no position to go and judge that person. The judge is God. I'm not. So if you choose to live in this particular way, you're free. However, how come you are entitled to choose whichever way you wish to choose to live, yet no one has the right to say nothing about that. And then when it comes to me choosing the way I wish to live, all of a sudden, I am a judgmental person. I am a discriminative person. And these Christian people are fanatic. They're crazy about their faith. Let me tell you one thing. Whatever my Lord Jesus taught me, I'll take that with me to the grave. Neither you nor anywhere else will impose that on me. You want to live your way? Go for it. You're free. But leave me alone. Live my life the way my Jesus taught me to live it. And having said this, I um, So do you see where Babylon comes from? Someone called Nimrod, the rebellious one, challenging God's existence, challenging God's sovereign authority. That Babylon is the United Nations, the same tower and the same intention and the same as assembly of nations. Babylon it started meaning Bab El, the proper pronunciation, Bab El. El is in Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac means God. Bab means gate. So Babylon, initially, it meant the gate of God. People entered through the gate of God to know how God operates in order to go against Him. And because they did this, because they challenged God, 
instead of being the gate of God where we all should come out to live in harmony, in peace, in love, respect, and in purity, it turned against us because of our evil intentions. It became Babel. Babel means Bulbala, which is confusion. So instead of being the gate of God, clarity, it became confusion. Look at the world. Aren't they living in confusion? They don't know what to do anymore. They don't know what to do with this body anymore. Well, now we want to marry a man. Next, you want to marry a woman. What are you going to marry? A dog, an air, a plant, a tree, a rock? Because, because human nature will never be content. Human nature will never be content because human nature outside of God will always lean towards evil and Satan will never stop giving you poison. That is the role of a snake. The snake can only do one thing, gives poison. What a poisonous world. Next time you go clubbing, you are, you are supporting Satan. I'll say this very bluntly. Next time you go to a Hollywood singer, you are supporting Satan. Next time you buy anything of this worldly nature, you are supporting Satan. Enough, enough. My people come out of it. Do not be where Satan dwells. Come out of that place. Come out of it. The United Nations, why is it the harlot? the mother of all harlots. We said the harlot is the one, is a Christian that is connected to Christ by name, but connected to Satan by deeds. Why then United Nations is a Christian one, since the nations, a lot of them are not Christians that gather there, because the one who established the United Nations was Great Britain and America. At the fall of, uh, at the end of World War II in 1945, Great Britain stopped and then gave way to America because they made America. And Great Britain and America established the leagues of nations which changed into the United Nations. And these two countries, America and Great Britain, what are they to the world? Christians. Christians from outside and vicious wolves from inside. And when I say America and Great Britain, I'm not meaning the people because there are absolutely wonderful people in Great Britain and in America. I'm talking about the governmental system. It is absolute evil. United, Sta United Nations is controlled by America. I don't want to repeat this. I've said it before. George Bush went into Iraq against so many countries that said you have, no, you have no right to invade a sovereign country. Yet he lied and he said Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. A liar. I come from Iraq. I know exactly what took place. In fact, anthrax, which is a powder very poisonous, anthrax was given by the defense minister of America to Iraq to overcome Iran in the Iraq-Iran war, which, which, which lasted eight years from 1980 to 1988. America gave anthrax to Iraq. You know why? Because they have to go to the Middle East. The stage is being prepared for the final role. World War III nuclear warhead will begin in the Middle East when Israel is striked by, the, by another great superpower, which America will no longer be that superpower. China is coming along with Russia. When Israel is striked, it's nuclear warhead and World War III will be the end of it. World War III began when Iraq was struck in 1980 and it will end up with nuclear warheads being used, the destruction of humanity.
All these agendas are all part of World War III. Because some sick in the head people, they want to reduce the world's population. And the way to destroy world population and reduce it, let's inject them first. Let's poison their air. Let's poison their food. Let's poison their water. And let's bring illnesses along where they will need chemotherapy. Well, they'll need these tablets. They're all chemicals. They're all poison. So we'll poison them inside and out. And then after a few years, so many will die. And those who are going to stay alive, we will make sure they're dead with a nuclear warhead. In order to achieve one thing, to know what is good and evil, <laughs> to destroy themselves by themselves. Isn't that sad? And that's sad. You know what? We have with us today two beautiful people, Michael and Susan. Um, they are here to uh, try and gather as many signatures as possible to send a message to the parliament um, to try and stop this madness that is happening in the educational system attacking our innocent children. I'm just going to read this first paragraph of this petition which they require signatures. Anyone here who is over 18 and registered to vote in New South Wales uh, can sign this petition. Anyone here who is over 18 and is registered to vote in New South Wales can sign this petition. And we need as many signatures as possible to send them uh, to the right places to say we don't need this. We, the undersigned residents of New South Wales, hereby submit this petition to request the immediate protection of parental rights and responsibilities and the preservation of our children's education in alignment with deeply held religious beliefs and values. We firmly assert that parents possess the inherent right and responsibility to guide their children's upbringing and moral education. This is just one of the paragraphs. I urge everyone who is 18 over 18 and is registered to vote in New South Wales to sign this petition. We need to get as many signatures, not in the hundreds, I pray in the thousands, in the tens of thousands. You can take these petitions with you. You can sign them here while you're here. You can take another empty one with you and give it to every person you know. We need thousands of these signatures. We're not fighting. We're not attacking. We're just saying, this is our belief. This is our way of living. As parents, we control our children and we want them the way they, want, they need to, to live. We cannot allow governments to impose a different lifestyle on our children. We gave birth to our children. We gave our life for our children to raise them, to provide for them, to give them the best of the best. How dare anyone else to come and say how my child should live or should not. Parents are the rightful owners. The children is theirs, not governments, not some sick laws. So please see Michael and Susan. You can stand up. Turn around. Yes, Susan, you can stand up as well. They'll be sitting in the foyer area. Um, Father Isaac, just show them the table afterwards. They can, they'll be sitting in the foyer area. Please, I encourage you to sign these petitions and um, to say that children belong to us as parents, not anyone else. You want to teach whatever you want to teach? Don't teach my child. I don't want you to do that. And you should stand for your rights. Because if you don't today, tomorrow you will not have a chance. Because evilness is infiltrating the world, my beloveds. Evilness is infiltrating the world. Um, just to leave you with this, so you don't sort of be kind of uh, pessimistic about all this. 
what is happening in the world even though it's negative but the Lord is bringing a very positive thing out of it what is that awareness the least the least to say awareness you see before we were blind because there was none of this nonsense so when we went out, we went out and we had fun and we said, it's the best country, it's the best government, it's the best life. But look at it. You see, we chased our own way of living. Where did we end up? Slaves. Slaves, my beloveds. Slaves. So now, are you still going to chase the world? Are you still going to do those wrong things under the sun? Are you still going to go to those dark alleys? Are you still going to take drugs and sell drugs? Are you still going to mix with people, with boys and girls and girls and boys? Are you still going to do the wrong things? Enough. Wake up. Do you see this freedom where it got us? Huge mess. Huge mess. We need to come back. Now is the time to repent. Ask the Lord Jesus to forgive us all. Lord, have mercy on me. Bring me back to you. I need you, Lord, more than ever before. I'm going to come to church more often. I'm going to give up on those drugs. I'm going to give up on those clubs. I'm going to give up on the wrong relationships. I'm going to give up on everything just for your sake, Lord. I beg you, Lord, have mercy on me. Amen. Amen. Dear Jacqueline, now let's um, be refreshed by another beautiful hymn. Amen. God help me now. We need that more than ever. Um, very quickly, um, do pray for us. God willing, tomorrow morning we're leaving to um, uh, going to Adelaide. We're going to the airport to go to Adelaide um, to meet our beloved people in Adelaide. That's for, it's the first time ever. We'll be there on Saturday and Sunday uh, at 6 p.m. We're trying to uh, live stream it at least on Saturday, tomorrow. So hopefully um, it'll be live streamed. Uh, one of the media team members is coming along with us to um, uh, put it together and hopefully we'll be able to live stream at least tomorrow, Saturday. Sunday we won't be able to because um, it will be clashing with the church um, um, service, the Sunday service. We don't want to people to be uh, mixed up between here and there so it'll be probably just live stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, more or less it's the first time we're going there we don't know what to expect but hopefully everything will be smooth by your prayers as well um, divine heart uh, liturgy will be held on saturday the 12th of august at 6 p.m. for all the divine heart sunday school um, children uh, along with their parents. So you're all more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about our Sunday school uh, services, please see one of the uh, parish priests uh, for more information. If you'd like to enroll your children, it's from the ages of five till 16. So um, we'll be more than happy to, um, to have your children in the school. Um, card making fundraising uh, event will be held on Saturday, the 26th of August between 2.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. at the church's hall and all proceeds will be going to the mission that we are going end of uh, next month to Turkey, Lebanon and Syria. Uh, and if you'd like to also um, donate, actually for this card making fundraising you need to see Valentina. Uh, she'll be at the foyer area. Um, you'll be making two cards. One you keep with you, the other one will be sending it and given it to one of the beautiful children in Turkey, in Lebanon, and Syria, and it'll be uh, personalized from you going to that child. So if you'd like to make a card for these beautiful um, little angels, please see Valentina um, and, and enroll and put your name down uh, for this card making fundraiser. For the uh, overseas mission, it's uh, the Good Samaritan Aid Society. If you'd like to donate towards that, um, all the money that we have received and will be receiving will be going to people in need um, uh, in person will be delivering those that money uh, in Turkey in Lebanon and in Syria 
So um, if you'd like to donate, it's the Good Samaritan Aid Society, Jesus, G-S-A-S dot org dot A-U. And you can um, either have a direct deposit or through PayPal. Um, I think the rest is... Um, one thing, I believe there are some of our beloveds here who have placed an order on some food hampers. You can uh, take them as you leave the church. You tell, uh, they are ready for this evening. So if you have ordered a food hamper, food angel hamper, it is ready when you leave, before you leave the church, please grab that hamper and take it home. And thank you for your support and for your generosity. This hamper is for $30 only. It's probably worth more than $200 if you go to any place out there. And the items in it, I shout for it. It's absolutely magnificent. Uh, you can't get any better than that. So it's very, very cheap. Only 30 bucks. Now, $30, they go towards helping people in Australia and outside of Australia. So the more you support it, the more we can help people. God bless you, and let us stand now for the finale prayer in Jesus mighty name amen in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit one god amen lord make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me sow love where there is injury pardon where there is doubt faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness light where there is sadness joy O divine master grant that i may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Don't forget to sign the petitions. God bless. See you next week.